Hello there, friends. This is Spencer Michaud, and today we're going to be talking about the sun's movement through the second decan of Aquarius uh, between 10 and 20 degrees of Aquarius. Uh, and we're going to be seeing this movement from January the 29th until February the 8th. And today we will talk about the sun's square with Mars at 12 degrees of Aquarius and Taurus, respectively. We will touch on the last quarter moon phase that's happening on February the 4th. And then we'll finish up talking a little bit about uh, a fixed star in the constellation Delphinius. Um, we are going to do a I Ching reading for this transit. And we'll break down some of the, the decanic symbolism of this area of the zodiac. So let me share my screen here and we will get to it. Hope you're all doing well, hanging in there. Uh, hope you had a good uh, Aquarius one transit. Um, just to review what was going on during the sun's transit through the first 10 degrees of Aquarius, uh, we recently saw a, a full moon in Leo at about nine degrees of Leo and uh, the opposition of that moon with the nine degree Aquarian sun. So we had something coming to a head uh, last week. We also had Jupiter making a Kazemi with the sun during that day as well. So a, a whole new Jupiter cycle, uh, a, a new way to create, maybe to create abundance, maybe to create order, to create stability, um, potentially new laws, new ag social agreements. Um, I think in the last week or two here, we're seeing, uh, we saw Venus go under the beams of the sun. And as I'm recording this today, Mercury uh, has just stationed retrograde and is heading under the beams of the sun as well. So we've got a psychopomp Mercury visiting the underworld. We've got Inanna uh, as Venus visiting Eresh Kigal, the, the lord of the underworld in the Sumerian myth. Um, so we, we have some underworld themes, some things where a lot of things are going on behind the scenes. And we're trying to move forward from potentially some kind of defeat, some kind of uh, realization where we uh, need to move on, where we're, we're trying to leave the past behind and embrace the future. And this Deccan is about transitions. Um, the tarot card that's associated with Aquarius II is the Six of Swords. And in it, we see someone being ferried across a river. Now, you can think about this potentially in relationship to uh, Charon, the, the uh, ferryman that took souls across the river Styx and into the underworld. Um, there is some interesting things that I've come across in some of my studies. Uh, I did a, a lecture at uh, the Great Lakes Astrology Conference last year on the correspondence with the tarot and the Thema Mundi. And in the Thema Mundi, we have cancer on the ascendant. Okay, And if we extrapolate all of the houses out, that would actually put Aquarius in the eighth house. So I know that this is somewhat uh, controversial as far as associating houses with signs themselves, but I was doing some experimenting with this uh, and with the Thema Mundi rather than putting Aries on the first house cusp. And I was looking at some of the tarot cards and there was actually some very unique uh, synchronicity between some of the, the narratives in the cards and the stories of these houses. So I think that understanding uh, the eighth house might actually help us um, with some of this symbolism. And you can think of this in an angular triad. All right. So if the seventh house is associated with completion, with the setting sun, um, with when planets come to the seventh house, they disappear under the horizon and, and enter the underworld. And we've got this concept of angular triad where we have two houses that are related to the seventh house, the eighth and the sixth. So the sixth is what happens before the seventh house angle. And the eighth house is what happens after. 
So by primary motion, the motion of the sun clockwise, houses are moving in this clockwise direction. So the eighth house will become the seventh house eventually. So like in my chart, I have Scorpio here and eventually Sagittarius will be on the descendant. But let's think about this where we have in the theme of Mundi, Capricorn on the seventh house and Aquarius is what will follow. So if we think about seventh houses as completion of death, it, was, it had uh, significations with death. Eighth house could be what happens after death. And uh, inter interesting that we see uh, a journey of leaving the past behind. You know, we had that, that five of swords in the first decade of Aquarius where we had some kind of conflict and a defeat, maybe the defeat of dying. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a defeat. It's a battle that we're all going to lose eventually. Um, and we may be heading off into the, the afterlife. And here we may be uh, punted across the river Styx by some kind of ferryman in that, with that six of swords. And eventually we're going to have to leave the old life behind in the seven of swords and move on to some unknown reality. Uh, the, the, the death is the ultimate unknown where we're leaving potentially even just leaving our, our entire identities behind, maybe leaving memories behind, leaving our bodies behind. And so what we're looking at with the middle decan is that transitionary phase. Uh, the condition, let's talk a little bit about the sun's condition. So let's just, actually, I'm going to back up for a second. The sun itself, what is the sun in astrology or traditional astrology? What do we, how do we think about it in modern astrology versus traditional? In modern astrology, we, we use it for uh, identity, say, I am this. Um, I think in traditional astrology, we, there is more of a, a leaning towards um, power, selection, being uh, somebody who is um, special, somebody who is very visible, um, the sun was also kind of an animating principle. It, it was associated with vitality. It was something that brings life. So it is the, the light of life, of vitality, awareness. I like the word awareness. The sun feels like a spotlight to me. And if, if we are trying to second guess the cosmic mind when we're doing astrology, Maybe the cosmic mind is shining a spotlight on, the, on these topics when we are seeing the sun move through a sign. And what is the sun shining its spotlight on when it's in Aquarius? Well, it's shining its spotlight on Saturn because it is drawing resources from Saturn. It is becoming like Saturn as it moves through Saturn's temple. So what is Saturn like? Well, it's interesting because Saturn is the opposite of the sun in the theme of Mundi. So what we have here is a, 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 an impulse or a, some kind of uh, planet that is trying to create vitality, but it's being given the resources of darkness. It's being given the resources of exile, deprivation, nemesis, which we can consider a rebalancing force. Uh, trying to bring balance to the randomized distribution of fate or chance. We can be shining a spotlight on isolation, on the outsider, those who lack power, on death. Uh, concepts like frost or freeze, if we're using agricultural metaphors. Okay? Um, there's also uh, concepts associated with laws and the way that we organize our societies. Uh, with Aquarius and with Saturn. Saturn was also boundaries. Uh, what is inside the boundary? What is outside the boundary? Um, if we think of the uh, Saturn also as passage of time, sobriety, cycles, entropy, I could go on and on with, with different ways of thinking about it. It's a very complex symbol. Uh, we could almost break this down too. If we think about from a psychological viewpoint, the sun as ego, uh, Saturn might be that quality of humility or becoming humbled through some kind of um, rebalancing retribution or punishment. Potentially, this is the, the, the rebalancing of hubris. And I think that we saw that in the five of swords in the first decan of Aquarius was 
uh, some kind of battle where we lost due to our hubris, due to going against natural law, we experienced uh, an ego loss. And now we're trying to move forward from that. We're trying to move on to something new. And it may be because we're feeling dejected, maybe because we're feeling isolated or that we are feeling not accepted by the, by the in crowd. Um, so those are some, some things to think about right away for the sun, just in, in Aquarius in general. Now, during this period of time, January 29th through February the 8th, um, we are going to see Saturn be the host of the sun for that entire period of time. Saturn is co-present with the, the sun, so it's hanging out in its own temple. Uh, the sun will be moving through the terms of Venus from 7 to 13 degrees, and then the terms of Jupiter from 13 to 20 degrees. So these are benefic bound lords or term rulers. And the term ruler was sort of like your middle school curriculum designer or middle school teacher. She wasn't necessarily the, the principal, but she was setting the, the, the course of study. And think about a middle school teacher, if you can remember back that far, uh, that you really liked and that was maybe a little bit nicer, a little bit more encouraging, a little bit more positive versus one that was a stern, tough teacher. So while uh, the sun is moving through these benefic bound lords uh, areas, um, we have a nice teacher right now. We have somebody who uh, is expecting us to use our qualities of patience, to use our quality of being able to create harmony and to create beauty, uh, to be able to tap into our higher selves and use our integrity to move forward through gentle efforts, not through violent efforts. And that's going to come back when we talk about the hexagram as well. There is a theme of, of gentleness that is coming about uh, with, with this reading today. The face rulers of the second decan of Aquarius are, it's a double Mercury face. So this is one, Mercury was the, the psychopomp that led souls to the underworld. And we see right now in our chart that Mercury is retrograde and is under the sun's beams okay as i record this right now okay I'm recording this maybe a day late in the cycle but if we just look at one chart here you can see that mercury is retrograde it's red and it is within 15 degrees of the sun okay which means that it is going to be entering the underworld and Mercury is really responsible for going between the boundaries. I think this is a, a really interesting paradox or dichotomy with um, Saturn because Saturn is the boundary itself and Mercury is going in between those boundaries. It's, it's uh, in the land of the living and then it goes to the land of the dead. It's, it's about communication, but communication and things like commerce are very similar because they're about exchanges. So Mercury creates ambiguity and doubt as well. It was the, the cosmic lawyer that was questioning things and bringing things into question. So whenever we're traveling from one place to another, there is a sense of, of doubt. There is a, a little bit of a danger inherent in traveling since we are unfamiliar with the territory. And we have to make sure that we have a, 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 good, a good guide. Um, you know, like if you... If you died in, in Greek, ancient Greek myth, you had to bring a coin with you to pay Charon, the ferryman. And that was, you know, you had Hermes with you to guide you to the underworld, but you had a number of helpers. So this may be a time to reach out for, for helpers and communicate with the people that can guide you to the, to the new experience that is, that is coming. Um, let me see. The tarot card is the Six of Swords. We've talked about that a little bit. Book T calls this card, and I'll show you again, Earned Success. The Book of Toth calls it Science. Austin Kopic named this decan Heaven and Earth. So again, themes of going back and forth between liminal spaces, crossing a threshold. Uh, that is associated with, with Mercury too, because it can go you know, under the beams. It can appear from under the beams. Um, it goes and, you know, it can communicate with the gods, it communicates with human beings, it's all about these conversations. And in uh, Joseph Campbell's book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, 
he talks about mythology and the monomyth and, and threshold guardians. So we may have to face some kind of threshold guardian if we are to uh, move to the special world. There were two worlds in his monomyth, the ordinary world where the hero starts out, some kind of call to action where we are called to leave the ordinary world and, and go on an adventure and go into some kind of magical special world that is very different. And right now we're in the process of feeling that call to action, leaving behind our known existence and moving out into an adventure. And a lot of times during um, uh, the first stages of an adventure, we may resist. There was something called refusal of the call in that monomyth. And uh, a lot of the times the hero does not want to leave home. Um, and that is something that we have to use our courage to overcome, uh, that we have to really, you know, become heroic. You think about Frodo in the Lord of the Rings. Um, he was given a responsibility to take the, the ring of power to, to Mount Doom for the, the sake of his community. I, I love that as an example for Aquarius. I, you know, it's not a coincidence that Elijah Wood, who played Frodo in the movies, uh, was an Aquarius son. I don't think that was a coincidence at all. I think he just embodied that quality of being able to understand the gravity and the weight of his responsibility. And it wasn't a personal selfish responsibility. It was something so that his um, brothers and sisters and his community members could survive. Uh, and he didn't, you know, think that he was worthy of this at first, but eventually he had to just, you know, suck it up and, and go on a journey. Same thing with Bilbo. Bilbo didn't want to leave the Shire uh, as well. I mean, this is kind of like this, you know, they were comfortable, but but eventually they did have to go on a long journey. And I think that we are in the stage of the story of the Lord of the Rings where um, Frodo and Samwise are, you know, going in potentially in secret across Middle Earth and trying to make it to Mordor to, to complete their task. So um, maybe, it may, this might be a great time to sit down and watch that movie. I think that, that there will be a lot of resonance for the sun in Aquarius during this period of time with that movie. Okay. So there are some other themes that Austin Kopic talks about in his book, 36 Faces. He talks about independence um, when we are bridging the gap between uh, the known and the unknown, between the ideal and the practical, um, between the, the insiders and the outsiders, we have a certain amount of independence. We're not beholden to anybody. So this may be a, a period of time where you feel a sense of freedom because you aren't committed to anything yet. And you may be trying to figure out where the next place of growth is or where the next adventure is going to take you, where the next responsibility is going to take you. And uh, yeah, so we are able to pursue un unorthodox methods when we aren't beholden to a, an established system. And I think that we saw this really... Um, prominently last week with the whole GameStop stock thing that happened. If you aren't familiar with that, a group of message board um, Reddit folks um, basically bested some hedge fund managers by beating them at their own game. So they were this ragtag little bunch of outsiders that uh, bought up a bunch of failing stock and, and ruined the plan of some big Wall Street hedge fund managers and their short sale plans. And they made a lot of money. And eventually they were kind of shut down by the system as well. Um, but not after they basically, you know, stuck it to the man. So pr pretty interesting, um, you know, circumstance there. I think that was happening at the full moon. And also while Jupiter was making that Kazemi with the sun. So we, we were seeing Jupiter in an area of the Zodiac associated with the outsiders benefits and abundance coming to the outsider. I thought that was just such a perfect, perfect representation of that. So we may see that continue as Jupiter is hanging out with the sun there, as we may see some benefits coming to the fringes of society or some unorthodox ways of creating um, wealth or creating prosperity in your life as well. Okay, 
one the one last note that I had here too, um, we can talk about the concrete versus the abstract with this Deccan. We can also think about the sun. If we're using it to define ourselves, which is a, a more of a modern concept, so I want to be careful with that. But if we are going to think of it that way, we may be defining ourselves, the sun, by what we reject, which is Saturn. Okay, so I think that those GameStop, Reddit, uh, that group was rejecting the rules of of Wall Street, and you know, defining themselves as like. Um, like the app that they were using to make money, like like modern day Robin Hoods. So, um, yeah, the symbolism of all that is is not lost on me. It's very interesting to see that all play out in real time. All right, the daimon that is associated with this Deccan is named Phobos, and Phobos was a uh, a spirit that was. Um, basically translates to panic-based fear, uh, flight and route from battle. And if you're not sure what the word route means, and I, I had to look it up to really get clear on it, it just means a wild confusion, a disorderly retreat. And Phobos was said to be one of the twin sons of Ares, the other one being Deimos, who was roughly translates to terror um, or dread. And these were the two uh, deities that accompanied their father into battle, uh, you know, spreading fear. So if you were going into battle, you wanted your enemies to be, uh, to be afraid of you. You wanted them to flee in terror. <laughs> and, um, you know, we see this, this uh, deity come up on, on, the, on the shields of great heroes like Agamemnon in the Iliad and also on Hercules' shield. So there's images of Phobos on those shields to, to maybe intimidate their enemies. Um, so this may also have some significations with this Six of Swords card where we're moving away from something. Um, so I guess we have to decide whether we are going to cross over the threshold because of being afraid. And there are some significations with Saturn around fear. Uh, or are we going to do it willingly? and gracefully and gently. Uh, and I think that that's gonna be one of the things we're gonna be trying to unpack during this, this week and a half of time. Now there is one fixed star associated with Aquarius two. And at 17 degrees, we have a fixed star called uh, Suolosin, Suolosin. And that was part of the constellation Delphinius. And I want to show you that there's some interesting symbolism associated with this. Here we see the sun in the second decan of Aquarius. And as we look, and I, I, I want to always make this clear when we are looking at the star chart, is that we do have a difference between the tropical zodiac and the sidereal zodiac. Sidereal being associated with the position of the constellations and the stars and the tropical being associated with the interplay of light and dark and the equinoxes and the solstices. And they are separating. In ancient times, they used to be very close together, if not conjunct. And now because of precession, they appear very different. So when we're looking at a tropical sign, which, which we use in Western astrology, um, we are looking at the sun in a position that is you know, hanging out in the constellation of Capricorn. So it can be a little bit confusing, although we do have an overlap with Aquarius here. Now, in this sidereal blend that we're doing, we are looking at both the constellations and the tropical meanings. So here we have Delphinius, the dolphin. And dolphins were uh, creatures that lived in the sea, obviously, and the, and the sea is a place, a liminal space. It is uh, a place between the heavens and the earth. There is mystery of where, of what is underneath it. Um, and Delphinius is about being playful. One little, uh, little trivia fact about so Suolosin uh, that I read in William Olcott's book, uh, Star Lore, is that uh, he believes that this was named after uh, an assistant astronomer to a very famous uh, astronomer named Piazzi 
uh, and his name was Nicholas. Uh, what is it here? I've got it in my notes. Nicholas Venator. And of course, there are two stars, uh, Soelusin and uh, what is the other one here? Rotenev. And that is, of course, Nicholas and Venator spelled backwards. So there may have been some little trick, uh, little, little inside joke with a famous ast astronomer and his loyal assistant naming these stars after him spelled backwards. It's pretty interesting. Um, but Bernard Brady talks about this star being about helpfulness. Dolphins were said to have helped sailors uh, if they were in trouble. Um, there was also a story of, of Hesiod uh, who had been murdered apparently. I didn't know this story, but Hesiod, the ancient poet, um, ancient Greek poet that wrote a lot about cosmology apparently was murdered and thrown into the sea and dolphins recovered his body and allowed his friends to find the murderers and then drown them <laughs> that was that was the vigilante justice back in ancient greek times like you know someone someone uh murdered your friend you know eye for an eye i guess but um but yes the dolphins were were instrumental in in creating justice and creating helpful um you know, rebalancing of a wrong or writing of a wrong. And uh, so playfulness, humor, being able to lighten up a little bit, that may be important as we're looking at a fairly heavy area of the Zodiac, a Saturnian area of the Zodiac. Sometimes our humor can help us to, to move forward from fear. Maybe the opposite of fear on some level is, is feeling joyful, playfulness, lightheartedness, right? So that might be the antidote to some of the things that are coming up in our experience. All right. So let's go back to our, our chart and let's go through some of the aspects that we're going to be experiencing. Now, first of all, before we move forward, we have to look at what planets are hanging out with the sun here during this time. And this is actually a period of time where we're gonna be having a number of planets. Uh, as of February 1st, we're gonna have five traditional planets hanging out in the sign of Aquarius. That's a lot. That is a lot of planets. Um, eventually, we, I think we're going to have the moon there too. Um, on the new moon on February the 11th, but that will be when the sun is in the third decade of Aquarius. So we have almost every planet besides the moon and Mars in Aquarius right now. So all of these, these planets are having a conversation with the sun and drawing upon that vitality and that energy. And all of these planets are making an overcoming square to Mars and to Uranus. So that's another thing that we have to consider is that this focal point on the outsider, this focal point on the exiled, this focal point on um, getting a detached perspective on what type of future we are moving away from and what type or, or what type of past we are moving away from and what type of future we are moving to is creating this tension with how we are dealing with our physical resources and potentially creating a separation. We may be feeling separated from our normal routines. That's what's happening when Mars is in the second decan of Taurus. It's we're disrupted from everyday life, the way things have always been done. Um, I was just a guest on um, uh, this uh, this kind of podcast or Instagram live with my friend C.V. Henriette, who has this site called Art of the Zodiac. And she was asking me about uh, that GameStop thing and and who was was the um, who was the the exiled? Obviously, we have the Reddit people, but then her question was, who are the hedge fund managers in this in this picture? And I think we can think of them as Mars a little bit too. We have like, they are being separated from their resources. These hedge fund managers were doing things the way that they had always done them and the rules weren't necessarily fair or just, uh, but they lost bill literally billions of dollars. So they lost money, they lost resources. And eventually they struck back at, you know, these Robin Hoods here by shutting them down, right? So- when we have planets in the overbecoming position, they're ultimately the winners. And I think they did win. They won a lot of money. And they, they showed people that the system was flawed. 
And, you know, Bernie Sanders is talking about it. Just Wall Street is based on lies and fraud. And I can't say that I completely disagree with him on that. But when a planet is, is being overcome by other planets, especially if it's a malefic, it can shoot rays backwards to those planets and injure them. It might not win the, the battle, but it might be able to hurt them a little bit. So uh, we did see like the, the hedge funds kind of fire back and try to, you know, <laughs> whine to the, I don't know, the, the whatever powers that be that that's not fair. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just laughing because like they've been, uh, they, they don't uh, think twice about bankrupting a company or stealing someone's home or, you know, taking advantage of people to make money. And uh, the minute that someone else beats them at their own game, they're going to start crying about it. And I, I, I just thought that there's some real poetic justice in all of that and some irony. And um, I have absolutely no sympathy for them. Um, so we'll see what happens moving forward. But it's, it's really, really interesting that this happened at a, a Jupiter Sun Kazemi, because maybe this will be a, a seminal moment, a seed moment for bigger systemic changes on how we deal with our resources as a community. And uh, that leads us to the first um, aspect that we're talking about here. And that aspect happens on February the 1st. It perfects on February the 1st. We're going to feel the lead up to it for the last days of, of January as well. But we have a square between the sun and Mars. Okay. So squares are of the nature of Mars. So this is conflict, separation. Okay. And the tarot card associated with Taurus too is six of pentacles. Benefits, all right? Benefactors, charity, receiving um, money, receiving resources. So there could be some real conflict uh, when the sun makes the square to Mars, where we may be having an awareness of changes that need to be made to the system, to the financial system, to the monetary system. We may feel separated from what we need to, to feel secure and stable, though, too. I think that I read recently that there was another snag in the in the stimulus relief packages and, and, you know, the rollout of all that in America, um, they just can't get their, their poop together. But hopefully we're going to be moving forward and, and into a, uh, a condition of, of restoration uh, eventually soon here. So that's, the, that's going on on Monday, February the 1st. Um, you know, we are in your, per let's, let's see if we can personalize this too. I want you to look at where the sun is in your chart in Aquarius and where uh, Mars is and really look if there's some tension between those areas of your life. In this chart here, we've got uh, a 10th house Aquarius stellium overcoming a, a first house Mars. So this could be like a, a new system that you're trying to enact in your job that is making it very difficult for you personally. And that is really disrupting your routines. It, you just may have a, a, a boatload of work that you're going through that is creating some, some challenges in the way that you go through your, your daily routines and habits. Um, I know my, my astrology teacher is a Taurus rising Mr. Achutabhava, and he's dealing with some of the, uh, I don't know, the fallout from his very successful Kickstarter campaign. I, fallout, I use that, that word judiciously, um, because he was very successful and did a very good job, and he's going to help a lot of people with the, the, the money that he raised. Um, but it sounds like, and I'm just, I'm, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but just watching him on his videos lately, he, he seems tired. He seems a little overwhelmed by the amount of work that he has lately. And I'm sure that all of the Kickstarter awards that he had to do and is creating extra work and disrupting some of the regular routines. And I think he's admitted as much on some of his recent videos. So you can see that is one example of how this stack up here. And it could be through good things. You know, it could be through positive change, like a, a Jupiter Kazemi, uh, you know, the sun. But it also is disrupting the routine. So that's one, one example of how that could play out. 
So take a look in your own chart and look at the topics of the two houses that that square is happening to see where a disruption may be happening in your own life uh, and creating some kind of severance, separation. Uh, and, and just know, though, that eventually I think that you're going to win out with the, the Aquarius stuff is, is in the stronger position right now. So there's all sorts of good things coming in that area of your life, I think. Uh, Venus is going to be entering Aquarius on February the 1st as well, lending her ability to have patience, lending assistance, lending our, our ability to receive good fortune. So there is some relief coming to that area as well. Um, but, but again, both Venus and Mercury are under the beams. And so there is a lot going on behind the scenes. And Mercury is really asking us right now, to, to take a look at that Aquarius house and ask ourselves what needs to stay and what needs to go, what is sustainable, what isn't. And those are, those are going to be valuable reflections right now as Mercury moves retrograde and comes into a Kazemi with the sun at the end of this cycle. So this, this, is, this is really a cycle about asking yourself those deep reflective questions as to what needs to, to stay in your life and what needs to go. And what kind of new systems can you put in place that will sustain you uh, in, into the future and long term? So this is a great time to have long term reflective thinking. Okay, let's move forward. On February the 4th, the next aspect that we're going to see with the sun is a square with the moon. So this is going to be coming from a, almost the opposite direction. So we have a last quarter moon, which is the closing square. And here, we're going to see some action in the Scorpio-ruled area of your chart, uh, where we're going to be dealing with uh, both the sun and the moon in their exile. So a very uncomfortable place for both of the lights. This could be where we're having some experiences that are, you know, kind of detrimental to, to our vitality. Um, this area of the zodiac where, that the moon is moving through uh, Austin Coppock calls mutual distillation. So this, he really talks about the um, kind of the habits that we are, you know, you know, let me see, how would I think about it? It's talking about trying to remove ourselves from bad habits, but, but being very entwined with other people or with the object of our affection. And so we can be very much contributing to each other's mutual poisons. So this may be a, a time frame where we are trying to detach and move on, okay, from this like very intertwined situation that we might have in our life in the Scorpio area of our chart. So in this in this uh, chart I have here, it's there may be something in the seventh house, uh, a partnership that is very intertwined, and there may be something that's um, toxic that is you're finding it very difficult to overcome uh, that will require a transition into a new reality. So that's another way that you can look at your chart and say, what, what am I really entangled with that I need to leave behind? And it may be painful, um, but ultimately you will feel a lighter load if you are uh, releasing what no longer serves you and getting disentangled from maybe something that is, you know, not not really healthy. Uh, that's not really bringing you joy. Okay. It's not contributing to your uh, solace and uh, playfulness. Um, and and that there's a little bit of a, a correlation with that too, because the sun is going to be starting to conjoin that fixed star at about 16 or 17 degrees of Aquarius. So the key to this, maybe just to lighten your load, to lighten up a little bit, to start to see the joy in life and not get too bogged down with the heaviness of it all and take everything so seriously. I know in the wintertime, sometimes it's really hard to find uh, joy, to find that, that solar you know, warmth. I know in the summertime, you can just lay out in the sun. You can feel good just by absorbing the sun's rays. And that's a lot harder to do in the winter, isn't it? We have to seek out joy. You know, We have to be intentional about it rather than um, just expecting that it'll, it'll be there all the time. So that might be something to think about as well. Okay. So let's look at uh, the hexagram associated with this. 
Um, I did an I Ching reading, and w- one little thing I wanted to talk about to actually I'll get well I'll get to that when I do the the reading, but I'm going to draw the hexagram. So I asked the I Ching, what is the essence of the sun's transit through Aquarius two, and how can we navigate it gracefully? Because this is all about navigation here, isn't it? How can we how can we try to I don't know master this time. And maybe that's a goal that you have mastering a time, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just surviving it. I think that it's a combination of those things. Be gentle with yourself, going with the theme. So we had um, the hexagram 18 moving towards the hexagram 57. So hexagram 18 is called repair or corruption. So there is something that is in need of repair. There is something that we determine that isn't working. 57 is gentleness or moving gently or subtly penetrating gentleness. And this was compared to like moving like the gentle wind. So we have something in our life, some corruption that was exposed potentially through the Venus-Pluto conjunction that's being exposed through... uh, the the retrograde of mercury a challenge in that area of our life Um, we're doing some deep reflection with venus and mercury right now so something isn't working and we are trying to leave whatever it was behind we maybe something came to light at the full moon showing you what wasn't working there was also a mars square to that full moon and now we're picking up the pieces we're we're moving forward with our life And we're moving on after every conflict, after every contest. Sometimes there's a winner, sometimes there's a loser. And we've we've all been on both sides of the coin. And uh, but you know, you move on. I mean, I I I I experienced this with sports, right? I played sports as a kid and I, I won some games and I lost some. And and at the end of the day, you have to, you know, shake hands and move on. And if you get stuck in your failure, you're not going to be able to move forward to the next match, right? Like I, I, I'm, I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. I'll just admit it. I love, I love football, and I love, I love sports in general. My analytical brain uh, gives me, a, it gives me a lot to chew on with sports. I see an inherent beauty in like the the ballet type dance of of athletics, and um, you know, I'm a Packers fan because my grandparents were. Uh, from Wisconsin. And it was a very, it was a, I have good memories associated with watching football with my, my family. It was a a time where we felt like we were all united. And my family was, uh, I had a lot of divorce in my family. Um, I had seven different step parents growing up. Uh, My parents got married and divorced a lot. And going to my grandparents and watching the Green Bay Packers was a, a point of stability. And uh, the Packers, they, they uh, you know, I'll finish up this digression here, but they just lost a really tough game. They lost a difficult game in the NFC Championship game. Uh, it was painful to, to a fan such as myself. But then you move on and you figure out what went wrong. Uh, and there was a number of things that went wrong, some poor decisions and some, some coaches that, that felt the repercussions of that. They fired their defensive coach and their special teams coach. Um, And then you figure out how you can move forward and move to the next phase. Uh, So they're thinking about now, who are they going to hire next? How are they going to move forward? How are they going to return next season with and return to a goal? And we maybe we can use that as just a metaphor for our own own life. We we saw the end of a contest and we may have been the winner and we may have been the loser. And now we have to prepare for whatever the next stage of our journey is. So let's talk about 18 a little bit. Okay, in hexagram 18, repair. Hillary Barrett, who is a, 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 uh, an author that translated the I Ching. And I also found out about this from my teacher at Chutubhava, that particular translation. I, I had been using the, the I Ching for many years um, before, before that, but I, used, I had a, my favorite translation was this old beat up book that I got called the, the Illustrated I Ching by R.L. Wing. And I'd been using that by writing them down on paper and tossing coins physically for, for uh, a few decades. I have, a, <laughs> I have like letters, uh, you know, full of old I Ching readings. It's pretty cool. 
But now I use this app on my phone, the I Ching app, Y-I-J-I-N-G, and it has multiple translations um, all packed into the app, like the, the full text of all of these books there. It's really awesome. And this Hillary Barrett one's really good because she has these focus questions. Um, and she asked for 18, what is behind this trouble? What is the hidden cause? And I will quote, and, and I think that's a really good question to ask because we've got Mercury and Venus going Kazemi. I'm sorry, going under the beams. And so we are going to be looking behind the surface of things and going into our own personal underworlds to be able to, behind the scenes, ferret out anything that was a problem and hopefully correct it. So the, the quote that came with this says, corruption, creating success from the source, going into our source, going into our sun, right? Now, this was cool. It says, fruitful to cross the great river. Well, look at what we have in our little card here. We're crossing the great river. <laughs> like the I Ching never ceases to amaze me. Um, it says, before the seed day, three days. After the seed day, three days. So this, this is really about paying attention to the cycle, like reviewing what happened to create the conflict, to create the corruption, and then being patient about uh, you know, correcting the problem. We're not going to change corruption overnight. We have to move gently. We have to let the process play out through consistent efforts over time. Another book that I like uh, that was recommended to me by this woman named Kat, who has a, a podcast named The Creative Introvert. I was recently a guest on her show, so hopefully that'll come out soon and you all can listen to that. But this is a book by Robert M. Place that talks about tarot, magic, alchemy, hermeticism, neoplatonism. And uh, he has his own deck, The Alchemical Tarot. And in that deck, there is a, a figure of a boat with a cloud, a personified cloud, blowing a gentle wind into the sails of that uh, boat away from the swords, away from conflict. I thought that was perfect. It was perfect for this reading. We had one changing line, line number five, and it's near the heavens. So it is something that is more in the idealistic realm, okay? Uh, it says, the ancestral father's corruption, okay? We're dealing with the, the decay or the corruption of the father or, or of those who have come before us. It says, use praise, use praise, okay? So this is about concentrating on what is right and what is good Con and, and becoming like Delphinius the dolphin and tapping into our inner humor, our inner optimism, our inner playfulness. And we're redeeming those that came before us. You know, we can't always change the past, but we can learn from the past and move forward in the spirit of hope. You know, this is another tarot card that's associated with Aquarius is the star. Yeah, you know, and that that is about hope. Okay, we are we are kind of dipping into the waters of our idealism so that we can move forward towards a hopeful future. All right. It says you will be honored for your efforts if you are able to uh, move with, with gentle optimism towards the new future. So I think that the key here is not to dwell on the past. Don't dwell on your failures. See the lesson, and but also see the good in that lesson. There are always silver linings to any type of humbling experience. And a, a lot of the time, the humbling, you're better off for it. You know, a lot of times we are moving against the natural way of things and the natural order and the natural, um, I don't know, the Tao. We're moving uh, against the Tao sometimes. That's, that was the, the offense that was most punishable by the, the Greeks was, was hubris. And when we try to move against nature, um, we're, we're always going to lose, I think. And we may win temporarily, but eventually it will catch up to us. That is, I think that's how it works. So this is moving to the hexagram 57, which is called subtly penetrating or moving gently. And Miss Barrett asks, how can you get to know this from the inside? What is taking shape? Uh, so this is about trying to understand the spirit or essence of, a, of an issue of our decay or corruption so that we can repair it and create change. So getting to the core of a, of a challenge. So it says, be like the gentle wind, gradual efforts in a consistent direction. Okay, so we can, like I said, we can't create change all at once. We have to be like this gentle penetrating wind that, that 
becomes part of the sail that is moving us forward into the unknown and into a new future. And we do have some fear because the, the unknown always creates fear. It's like this, this uh, you know, innocent fear of the dark, right? When we were younger, we wanted the nightlight on because we always wanted to know what was, what was in the, the closet. But sometimes we just have to trust and have faith that uh, the unknown is not a terrible monster and is not a beast that is waiting to swallow us up. There will be challenges and there will be monsters that we have to face, but it's not always, uh, change is not always a bad. Change is not always something that will lead to conflict or lead to loss. Um, sometimes it can lead to liberation. And uh, I think this is a good time to really tap into that energy of faith and that energy of hope. All right. Well, that's what I have for you today for Aquarius 2, the sun in Aquarius 2. Uh, yeah, just, just hang in there. Move gently. Re recognize that this is a transitory time and that we aren't always going to know what uh, the future holds, but we have to be hopeful about the future. And if we, we you know, don't cart, don't cart demons with you. Don't cart the dead, right? Let, let, the, let the dead bury the dead is a phrase that, that I, I've heard tossed around a little bit. You don't have to keep carrying corpses with you uh, as we move forward into the future. So, you know, be gentle to yourself. Be gentle to the people around you. If you're trying to be an agent for change, and I think a lot of us are, um, be patient with the, the forces that you are uh, rejecting or rebelling against. Um, yes, it does take energy, but it takes consistent energy over time to create change. Nature works on her own time, and nature is not going to be rushed. And our, our lives are slow. Uh, our, our, well, let me back up. Our lives are short, that's what I meant to say, in comparison to the eons of time. And what seems to be taking a long time is actually just the blink of an eye in the uh, consciousness of eternity. So be patient with the process. All right. If you're enjoying the work that I do here, please hit that like button. Tell me all about your experience in Aquarius 2 season. What are you moving past and what are you hopeful about in the future? Let's try to keep it real positive in the comments this, this week. Tell me what you're hopeful for. Uh, because I think if you share your enthusiasm and your joy, the, the universe is, it has a way of, of helping to bring you some of those things. Uh, you know, there are limits to that, but I, I think it can be really healthy to, to verbalize some of the things that you're trying to move away from and what you are trying to move towards. It's okay to be confused about it too. You don't have to have it all figured out right now. All right, so that's what I've got. Uh, you can support the work that I do uh, by clicking that subscribe button, clicking the like button, leaving me a comment, sharing this with your friends. If you want to make a material donation to the work that I do, I have a Venmo account at Spencer Michaud and a PayPal me, paypal.me backslash Spencer Michaud. You can also support the work that I do and get some clarity about what's going on in your life by reaching out and scheduling a reading. I always love hearing from you and I always love being of service uh, to you and being a translator of the stars. So that is what I've got for you today. Be kind to yourself and to one another and I will talk to you soon. Peace.